All right, we're continuing our series, In Jesus' Name, talking about prayer. I want you to turn to two passages of Scripture, Ephesians chapter 3 and Revelation chapter 5, all right? Ephesians chapter 3. Now, here's how you remember where Ephesians is. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, General Electric Power Company. (laughs) Never mind. All right. Open to Ephesians 3, put a marker at Revelation 5, and um, here's the title today, Why Keep Praying? Why Keep Praying? Uh, I heard about a little boy that uh, went to his dad and said, I want a little brother. And his dad said, well, you ought to pray about that. And so he prayed for one month, nothing happened. Prayed for two months, nothing happened. Prayed for three months, nothing happened. And so uh, he just quit praying. And about six months after that, his father took him to the hospital, pulled back a curtain, there was a baby brother. And then the father said, but hold on. He pulled the curtain back a little farther, another baby brother. Pulled it back a little farther, another baby brother. He said, now, aren't you glad you prayed? He said, yes, but aren't you glad I stopped after three months? (laughs) So I'm asking you, why keep praying? When we don't see results, why keep praying? Now, I want to ask you a a question before we get into the points and read the Scripture and things like that. First of all, the first question I want you to answer, the next question, few questions. I don't want you to answer. I want you just to think about them, all right? Here's the first question. Does God have all power? Yes. Yes. All right? Now, for Him to release that power, do we need to pray? Now, hold on before you don't answer the question. Think about some of these. Do we bother God enough to get Him to finally release power in prayer? Is that what prayer is? Some people think it actually is because Luke 18, Jesus tells about an unjust judge that he was bothered, so he did something. I just want you to understand, I understand the principle of the story, but God is not an unjust judge. (laughs) So does prayer bother God? If we bother him enough, will he do something? Um, when we pray, are we trying to talk God into it? Does God require a certain amount of prayer for certain situations? Do we earn answers to our prayers? Experience Gateway Church Live from anywhere you are at gatewaypeople.tv. If you have internet access on your computer or mobile device, you are only a click away from experiencing great worship and teaching. Don't miss church because you're on vacation, out of town on business, or even if you're just feeling a bit under the weather. Visit gatewaypeople.tv and be a part of our live service. For service times, visit gatewaypeople.tv. So let's talk about it, all right? Here's number one. God has deposited His power in us. This is extremely important to understand. God has deposited His power in us. When you understand this about prayer, you will become a person of prayer, and it will help you to understand how and why we pray and why we keep praying. Now, before we read Ephesians 3, let me tell you two other verses. Luke 24, verse 49, Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high, until you receive power, you receive power from on high. Acts 1.8, but you shall receive power. You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. You are going to have power deposited in you. 
Now, we're going to read a verse in Ephesians 3 in just a moment. Let me quote part of it and see if you've ever heard this. God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we could ask or think. How many of you have heard that verse before? Can I see your hands? Okay. Now, I asked three pastors on our staff to tell me what the rest of the verse says. None of them could. They are on administrative leave. (laughs) I want you to be honest, be honest, because it'll be the majority. How many of you, now don't look at your Bibles, okay, don't cheat, you're in church. Don't look at your Bible. How many of you don't know what the rest of the verse is? Be honest. Can I see your hands? Most of you. All right. How many of you know what the rest of the verse is? Can I say, okay. You might want to apply. We have some openings here. <clears throat> all right. Here it is, Ephesians 3.20. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to to the power that works in us or that resides in us. Now, we're going to get to that last phrase in a moment. I just want you to know, though, that uh, this is a verse that is amazing grammatically. It is amazing how the Holy Spirit structured this verse. I want you to think about this. It says, to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we could ask or think. You have to understand that he could have left out the three adverbs, exceedingly abundantly above. He could have left those three out and the verse meant the same. Now, to him who is able to do all that we ask or think. But what is all? All is all. Now, to him who is able to do all. But apparently the Holy Spirit didn't think that that described the Godhead adequately. So he puts the word above in front of the word all. Now to him who is able to do above all. How do you even even do that? To him who is able to do above all. And then the Holy Spirit thought, well, that, that really doesn't do it either. To him who is able to do abundantly above all that we could ask or think. And then he thought, well, that really doesn't describe the Father either. To him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we could ask or think. It's a pretty amazing verse when you think about it, isn't it? Okay. But uh, let me say it this way. Is God able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we ask or think? Is he? Okay. Here's my next question then. And why doesn't he? I mean, in my life, in this situation I'm going through, in my marriage, in my family, if God is able, he's able, why doesn't he? That last phrase tells us, according to the power that works in us. Another way to say that is that resides in us. According to the power that he has deposited in us. This word according, um, it is the Greek word kata. Uh, it actually means, uh, it denotes measurement. It, it means to measure out, to measure out. Uh, one definition means to den- it denotes uh, distribution. That's a real, real simple question I want to ask you. How much of God's power are you measuring out to your family? How, how much of God's power are you distributing to the situation that you need God to work in right now? Is it possible that God's already done his part and deposited his power in us and now we measure it out or distribute it? Have you ever thought about that? Let me say it another way, and this this is going to shock you what I'm about to say. God's unlimited power is limited to our prayers. God has all power, but his unlimited power is limited in my life by my prayer. It depends, am I going to distribute it? Am I going to measure it out to my family, to my situation?
Deciding where you want to invest your life's work is one of the most critical decisions you will ever make. With a multitude of challenges in today's job market, Gateway wants to come alongside you and help. Are you seeking a job or needing an employee? The Gateway Job Center can help. The Job Center is a place for employers and job seekers within our congregation to connect with each other. Just log on with your Gateway One username and password and begin your journey. Visit jobcenter.gatewaypeople.com today. And here's point number two. We must release His power through prayer. We must release the power of God through prayer. He has deposited His power in me, and we release that power through prayer. Now, I'm going to read you, we'll get to Revelation 5 in a moment, but I want to read you a, a scripture about this power, and I want to use the analogy that Jesus uses. He uses the analogy of the river. And I want you to think about how wide your river is. Is it a gushing river or is it a trickle? Uh, John 7, verses 37 through 39, on the last day, that's the last day of a feast, and I'll tell you about the feast in a moment. On the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out saying, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the Scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Rivers. But this he spoke concerning the Spirit. Remember we talked a moment ago, the Holy Spirit comes on you, you're going to receive power. This he spoke concerning the Spirit whom those believing in him would receive, for the Holy Spirit was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. Okay, here, here's what happens. This is an eight-day feast in Jerusalem. And for seven days they prayed for living water, living water. It's based on two principles, two uh, prophecies in the Old Testament, one occurrence and one prophecy, okay? Let me say it that way. Uh, if you remember when the children of Israel were going through the wilderness, Moses spoke to the rock one time, he struck the rock one time. He actually, God told him to speak and he struck it. So, but the point is, water came out of the rock, and they always referred to that as living water. Zechariah 14.8 prophesies that God's going to flow living water out of Jerusalem again. So they gathered in Jerusalem for an eight-day feast. For seven days they prayed for living water from heaven. Living water. On the eighth day they prayed for rain. Now, it's not wrong to pray for rain. As a matter of fact, we need to keep praying for rain in Texas and in the south right now. We need to keep praying for rain. But it was wrong the way they did it. Because what they did in essence was we're going to pray for living water, but if we can't get living water, we'll just take natural water. And it was such a religious uh, show that they went through. Even at this fe many, feast, many of them um, got drunk and many of them um, uh, committed immoral acts at this feast. And they're praying for living water for seven days. On the eighth day, they're going to pray for rain. And here's what happens. On the eighth day, before they pray for rain, after praying for seven days for living water, Jesus stands up and says, I'm the living water. I'm the answer to your prayers. You've been praying every year you gather at this time, and you pray for living water. He who believes in me, if you're thirsty, come to me and drink. He says, I'm the water. Okay? And then he makes this statement. The one who believes in me, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. And it says, this he spoke of the Spirit. Now remember, you shall receive power when the Spirit comes on you. And wh what is the Holy Spirit going to do? Flow out of your heart. Flow out. So I, I have just a very, very simple question for you. How much power, the Holy Spirit is power, how much power is flowing out of you? you, the, uh, you if you believed... God has deposited the Holy Spirit in you, and we know that we just read, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. How much of God's power is flowing out of you? Is it possible that you have your hand on the faucet of God's power in your life? And instead of us praying and asking God to release the power, we might not be praying to get God to move, we might be praying to release the power and open the faucet in our lives. You know, many of us have more faith 
in the hot water faucet than we do in prayer. Because we turn it on and then stand there and we just wait and we wait and we wait and we wait and we wait. Yeah, any of you have a house where it takes a long time? It's like you wonder, where did they put the hot water here? They, I think they put it, personally, I think they put it in my neighbor's house about three, three houses down. Because you just stand there and wait. Okay. And so here's what we do in prayer. We turn the faucet of prayer on, we feel the water and it's cold, and then we just turn the faucet back off. We stop praying. Instead of knowing, if I leave this faucet on, it may feel cold, but it's going to get hot. It's going to get hot if I leave this faucet on. <clears throat> Why did Elijah pray seven times? Never thought about that? For something God said he was going to do. God already said he was gonna, it was going to rain, but he prayed seven times. Was he releasing power to fulfill the word of God in his own life? Why did Daniel pray 21 days? Uh, I, we'll get to Revelation 5 in a moment, but let me read that to you. Daniel 10, verses 2 and 3. It says, in those days, I, Daniel, was mourning three full weeks. Now, by the way, do you know why he was mourning? Because he was trying to eat, ride, and exercise. <clears throat> <laughs> he was on a fast. <clears throat> Verse 3, I ate no pleasant food. Anyone relate? No meat or wine came into my mouth, nor did I anoint myself at all till three whole weeks were fulfilled. He didn't take a bath. The people around him were mourning also. <laughs> Verse 12, then he, this is an angel that visited him, said to me, do not fear, Daniel, for from the first day that you set your heart to understand and to humble yourself before God, your words, we could say prayers, were heard. And I've come because of your words, because of your prayers. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days. And behold, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help, for I had been left alone there with the kings of Persia. Okay, Here, here's what he said. The first day you prayed, I left heaven with your answer. I left heaven with your answer. But there's a war in the heavenlies. But because you kept praying... I was able to get through. We know that there's a war in heavenly places, in spirit, there's spiritual wickedness in high places, and we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. We know that. We wrestle and we pray and we release the power of God to be able to bring the answer to our prayer. But I want you to understand something. You're, the prayer, the answer is sent the first day you pray. What if Daniel had stopped praying after 20 days? I wonder how many of us stopped praying. See, think about this way. How much of the work of salvation has been done? Let me, let me just let you know. All of it. Now, it may not be done in your life because you have to receive it. But everything that God needs to do or needed to be done has been done. Jesus is never going to die on the cross again. He's, it's complete. It is finished. Right? It's done. But we have to do something now. I, I'm just wondering, this, what you're praying about, has it already been done in the heavenlies? But we need to move it from heaven to earth. Uh, Ephesians tells us that we have been blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Let, let me just ask you this. How many spiritual blessings have you been blessed with? All of them, every one of them. Well, why don't you see it in your life? because you have to move it from heaven to earth.
The work has been done, but it depends on what we're going to do now, we're, how we're going to respond to it. So, we, he, we must release His power through our prayers. And here's number three. God adds His fire, I put in parentheses, power to our prayers. And this is an amazing truth in the Bible. I want you to look at Revelation 5 because you're going you're gonna to love to see this in your Bible. God adds His fire to our prayers. Revelation 5, look at verse 8. Now, when He, that's Jesus, had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb, each having a heart and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. Okay, now, according to this verse, uh, what containers store your prayers? Bowls, right? Bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. Now, flip over maybe one page, Revelation chapter 8. Maybe two in your Bible. Revelation 8, verse 1. When he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. This is the verse why many theologians believe there will be no women in heaven. <clears throat> I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Okay. okay. Here, here's the only reason I say that. I know half of you are mad at me now. I, I, I don't mean it that way. Let me tell you the only reason I share that, because when I was young and stupid as a preacher, I would say that from the pulpit, you know. And here's, and one time after I said it, this little old lady came up and tugged on my coat and said, there won't be any preachers there either. <laughs> I, I, I actually think that's better, all right? All right. Verse 2, and I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. Then another angel, having a golden censer, came and stood at the altar. A golden censer. He was given much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints ascended before God from the angel's hand. Then, then the angel took the censer, filled it with fire from the altar, and threw it to the earth. It moved from heaven to earth, and there were noises, thunderings, lightnings, and earthquake. In other words, it affected earth when it got here. Okay, listen. Here's what it's saying here. There are these bowls. And when these bowls get full and that incense goes up to the throne of God, there is an angel that his job is to add the fire from the altar, God's fire, to our prayers and throw them back down to the earth. This is the same fire that fell on Mount Carmel. This is the same fire that stood before Israel and the, and the people of Egypt when they came out of Egypt. This is the same fire that fell on the day of Pentecost. It's the fire and the power of God. So I have a very, very simple question for you. How full are your bowls? Do you have a bowl that's for your family and a bowl that's for your marriage and a bowl that's for your work and a bowl that's for your health and all these bowls in heaven? How much prayer, how much time have you spent in prayer praying over this area of your life? I mean, think about it. If you were able to see the bowls in heaven that you've been praying for your kids or for your job or for your business or for your family, if you could see, how full would that bowl be? Is it possible these bowls in heaven are on like a, a fulcrum and, and, and when it gets full, it spills over? Like, like you've seen these, these, uh, these uh, water fountains and they have this, the water going down and it falls into a bowl, and when that one fills up, it tips and goes into another bowl, and that one fills up, it tips. And you ever seen something like that? I wonder how full are your bowls? Because when they get full, there's an angel assigned to add God's fire to your prayers and throw them back to the earth, and it'll change what's happening on earth. I told you a few weeks ago about George Mueller praying 63 years for his friend. I told you last weekend about a woman uh, that prayed 42 years for her husband. Some of you heard the story about how my grandfather came to the Lord. Some of you haven't. But there was a man that prayed for my grandfather for 40 years. There was a time in, in my grandfather's life when he worked for the Texas 
um, uh, Department of, of um, Transportation. His job was to put asphalt in potholes. That was his job. And for a season, he worked with a man named Ray Alexander. And Ray Alexander was a Christian, and he shared Christ with my grandfather, who did not know anything about the Lord. And one night, uh, one day, my grandfather said, I'd like to hear more about this. And so Ray said to him, well, why don't you come over to my house after dinner, and I'll, I'll share with you some more and show you some verses in the Bible. So my grandfather said, okay. So that night after dinner, he got ready to go, and my father had just turned 16 and just gotten his driver's license. So he said to my grandfather, when my grandfather started to go, he said, hey, where are you going? He said, I'm going to talk to a man at work about some things. And my father said, can I drive you? He just wanted to drive. So my grandfather said, yes, but you have to stay outside while we talk. So he drove him over there, and my grandfather went in, and my father went and sat on the steps of the front porch. And back in those days, no air conditioning, so the door was open but the screen door was closed. And for the first time ever, at 16 years of age, my father heard the gospel. Had never heard that Jesus was the Son of God and that died and died for his sins. Never heard it. And the man, Ray Alexander, said to my grandfather, would you like to accept Jesus as your Savior? And my grandfather said no. I'd like to think about it for a while. And then Ray said, well, if you ever decide to give your life to Jesus, you need to pray a prayer like this. And he told him the sinner's prayer. And as he told my grandfather, my father, sitting on the steps, prayed the prayer and gave his life to the Lord. My father was the oldest of three brothers. One of the, the, he had two, two brothers, all right? The oldest of two brothers, I should say, the oldest of three sons. Three boys in the family is all, no, no girls. One of the brothers committed suicide. The other brother uh, died a few months after getting out of prison. My father was the only believer in his family. 16 years of age, went to college, the only one to go to college. Started a company. God blessed him. Became a huge giver to the kingdom of God. Raised me. In a Christian home, I accepted the Lord. I went into ministry. Many, many people have accepted the Lord now. Because a man that put asphalt in potholes shared with another man, and he thought, as far as he knew, he said no. A few years after I came to know the Lord, I got concerned about my grandfather. So I started praying. We had a family reunion coming up, and I started praying I'd get to talk to him about the Lord. And so at that family reunion, God orchestrated the time for us to be alone in a room, and I started sharing the Lord with my grandfather. And my grandfather told me, he said, a man told me this 40 years ago, and I've always regretted that I didn't give my life to the Lord. And I said, you can give your life to the Lord today. And I led my grandfather to the Lord. He was 78 years old. He lived until he was 82 years old. And we saw a change in his life. After he passed away, I thought to myself, I wonder if the guy, Ray Alexander, that witnessed to him is still alive. And I just felt like I needed to call him. So I, uh, when I, went to, I called directory assistance. This is before we had the internet. <clears throat> That's how we used to get, have to get phone numbers. We had to call and ask people. <laughs> and I got his number, and I called him, and he answered the phone. He was 81 years old. And I said to him, do you remember Joe Morris? And he said, yes, I still pray for him to this day. And I said, well, uh, I'm his grandson. Did you know that my father accepted Christ that day on the steps? He said, I didn't know that. And he started to cry. I told him, I'm a minister, and many people have come to know the Lord now. But it's all because you shared the gospel. I said, you, you said you still prayed for my grandfather to this day. Well, why do you still pray for him? Listen to this. He said, in the back of my Bible... I have all of the names of the men that I've shared Christ with. And I pray for every man until he accepts Christ. And when he accepts Christ, I put a check beside his name. And your grandfather was the only name in the back of my Bible that didn't have a check beside it. 
And when I get off the phone, I'm going to put a check beside your grandfather's name. Prayer works. I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes. What's the Holy Spirit saying to you? What do you need to pray about right now? What are you going through right now? What maybe is in your life that you feel like nothing's going to change? What area of your life do you need the power of God released in? A God who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we could ask or think. We want to pray for you. No matter which campus you're attending, in just a moment, this is what we're going to do. We're going to have leaders at the front. We'll have leaders at the front of every campus. We'll have leaders on the second level at the South Lake campus by all the exits. We'll have leaders in the overflow rooms. If you need prayer for any area of your life, I want to ask you in just a moment just to come to the front of whichever uh, campus or venue you're in. Just come to the front, one of the leaders, and let us pray for you. You don't have to be a member of Gateway Church to come for prayer. And we're not asking you to join this church. Just simply by you coming for prayer doesn't mean you're saying you're going to join this church. But we want to pray for you. So if you're going through a difficulty in any area of your life, no matter which campus you're attending, if you need prayer in just a moment when we stand up, as soon as we stand up, just step out and come. Come to the front. Come to one of the leaders. Let us pray for you. Holy Spirit, I pray you'll draw every person that has any prayer need at every campus in Jesus' name. Amen. In The God I Never Knew, Robert Morris explains that the Holy Spirit's chief desire is for a relationship with you to offer the encouragement and guidance of a trusted friend. I want you to understand that all of these gifts, all of God's gifts have to do with ministering to people and they have to do with encouraging people. It's time to experience the Holy Spirit in a fresh new way to meet the God you may have never known. You have someone living inside of you who knows everything about everything. And he has committed himself to be your teacher and to lead you into all truth.